I want to share this morning uh, a little bit about the world, the flesh, and the devil. Anybody ever experienced any of these? Every day, our spirit man, the Bible says that there's an outward man and there's an inward man. One of the great mysteries I believe in in our walk with God is to understand that there's two of us. There's an outward man and there's a spirit man. And you know what? I'm going to share a little bit more about this later on, but do you know that you have conversations with yourself? Who do you think you're talking to? <laughs> it's either a spirit man speaking to the natural man or the natural man speaking to the spirit man. You ever found yourself talking to yourself? That's not a problem. It's when you start answering yourself, that's when you get it. <laughs> But you see, there's an outward man and there's an inward man. And when we sort of can understand that, there's a spirit part of us. But every day, our spirit man has to run the gauntlet of the world, the flesh, and the devil. Being bombarded by the pull of the world, the lust of the flesh, and the temptations of Satan. John, call, John Bevere calls it the bait of Satan. 75-year-old man decides that he's going to go down to the beach and have a swim. He notices that he's got a hangover. <laughs> you don't know what that means. <laughs> Everything's hanging over. <laughs> and then he's sitting there on his towel and he watches this guy about 19 strut past and he's got muscles everywhere and, and he looks, man. And the old boy says, man, I'd like to look like that. So he goes to the gym and dies of a heart attack. <laughs> We're all being affected somewhere along the line. There's, you know that there's shoe devils? There's food devils. Did anybody here ever fasted? And, you know, you're feeling hungry and you've been praying and you've been doing this and you've been doing that and doing all the things and all of a sudden you think, oh, I'll just go and relax for a little while and you turn the telly on and the first sign you see is somebody eating a Big Mac. <laughs> all of a sudden every ad seems to be a food ad. <laughs> And the juices in your stomach start doing the watusi. I decided to bless Nancy the other day, and I said, "Man, I'm going to bless you today. I'm going up to the fish shop. I'm going to buy fish and chips." <laughs> I went up to the fish shop, and there was this older gentleman sitting beside me, sitting near me, waiting for our fish orders. And all of a sudden, three young girls walked in. They were about between 14 and 16, I suppose. They had the briefest bikinis I've ever seen in my life. And they were bouncing around and things were moving that shouldn't be moving. <laughs> and uh, they were giggling and carrying on and, and one would jump up and go outside and the other one, then they come back in. They never had any other cover. They just had their, these little skinny things. You could, you, you, if you screwed it up, it would have fitted into a coffee cup. <laughs> and they got their phones and they're looking at their phones and they're giggling and all. And I, I didn't know, but this old fellow was sitting beside me. He was just sitting there. And all of a sudden, the, the, the person at the fish shop called out the name and this young girl jumped up and said, come on, Pop. And old Pop gets up like this, and, and he looked at me, and I looked at him, and I said, man, I said, you got trouble. <laughs> you, you're in trouble or something like that. He said, tell me about it. Amazing. Pull, pressure. 
to stay fresh and overflowing with his presence and victory. How many people want to stay fresh and overflowing in, in his presence and victory? You must live a constant. Everybody say this word, constant. Life of surrender. Surrender to his will. If we really want to stay fresh and overflowing with his presence and victory, we must live a consistent life of surrender. It's not a hit and miss thing. It's not something that you do. If you want to give up smoking or if you want to give up a bad habit, it's not a matter of, well, today I will, tomorrow I won't. You can't just live a certain way for, for 20 hours and then for the next four, fall to it. Because you'll never quit. You'll never overcome it. You'll never break the stronghold. You'll never break the power of it. You have to live a consistent life of surrender, saying no. Many people, if you start talking like that, would run for the hills at that statement. But say we love the fun and the exciting part of being a Christian. And I, I totally, 100% agree. Christianity should be fun, should be exciting, should be full of enthusiasm, should be able to dance and clap and shout and sing. But you can't do that. And it's not a matter of shouting and singing and having fun and, and then trying to live a surrendered life. Because one becomes over freedom and the other one becomes over law. We need both. Can I hear an amen? We need, we need the joy and the victory, but we also need to be able to surrender. Surrender to his will. Surrender to, to who he is and what he is and all about him. Because you see, there's a pull of the enemy. We love the fun. We love the exciting part of being in the kingdom, free spirit. And that is very, very true. When it comes to living a crucified life, wow, that's old-fashioned. No, friends, we need the both of them. Satan will trap us or snare us if he can find a crack in our armor. You believe that today? The world, the flesh, and the devil. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, we know these verses of Scripture only by heart. We could quote them and quote them and quote them, but I want to just share something perhaps a little bit different out of this so that we can understand it. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. It says in verse 3, it says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. We, we, we quote that, but why did what caused Paul to speak about this? Why did Paul share these things? What brought this on? What was, he, what was he talking about? If you read in chapter 9, you find here that Paul was speaking about bring, gathering an offering from this particular group of people that had promised an offering. But he senses that there's something wrong. Instead of, instead of giving with a, with a grateful heart and a joyful heart, there's something that's entered in, and now these people, yeah, they most surely would have given the money, but it was grudgingly. When you start talking about money, people start to get all different thoughts in their minds. What Paul was here trying to do, he was trying to explain to these people that if you do it right, God will bless you. No man gives houses or, 
or whatever or whatever that God won't give back a hundredfold. God is a rewarder. He is not a withholder. He is not mean. He wants to bless people that diligently seek Him. He is a God of love. He is a God of blessing. He is a God of mercy. He wants to pour out upon everybody. But you see, what Paul is, is addressing, an attitude in the church. Paul is talking about giving, and these people are getting cranky. Not giving money. The attitude in the church is, all the church wants is our money. I would imagine one of the biggest uh, negative thoughts that go around the world about Hillsong is about the money that they make and how much money, and that's all they tell you about it. But friend, they don't tell you about the literal hundreds of thousands of people in Australia and outside of Australia that have been dramatically touched by the generosity of that church. By the generosity of that church. And you see, what you don't understand sometimes when you see somebody that's, that's wealthy, that's a Christian, that's learned the art of giving, the Bible says you cannot outgive God. So if you give everything away, God just keeps sending it back. <laughs> and it's impossible to go broke when we're doing it God's way. When we learn the art of being able to respond to God. And these people were there and, and Paul said, uh, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, but he who sows, sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. What that word bountifully means there will also reap with blessing. God wants to bless you. And if you read a little bit earlier, it says, I beg you that when I am present, I may not be, that may not be bold. It says, and it says, against some who think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. You talk about money and people immediately think you're getting into the flesh. But Paul was trying to say, no, look, if you sow sparingly, that's how you're going to reap. But if you can give bountifully, you're going to receive an abundance. God is an abundant God, amen. He is a wonderful God. But I want to just say today, every day, our spirit man runs that gauntlet. And it's being tested and it's being tried and it's being buffeted and the enemy comes to try to rob, to kill and destroy Because he in their minds was talking about money. He wasn't talking about money in reality. He was talking about blessing. Talking about being blessed. Opening the windows of heaven. 2 Corinthians uh, 10 verse 2, it says, There are some who think of us as if we walk according to the flesh. You see, if the devil can sow a seed of doubt in your mind, the flesh will take over. They work hand and glove. You might see something there. You might be very, very innocent. You might say, okay, Jason, and here's Jason, and I, but I go over to Lorraine, and I speak and say, hello, Lorraine, it's lovely to see you here today. It's wonderful that you could come, blah, blah, blah. But Jason's sitting there saying, he didn't say that to me. He, and so in our mind, there's, and then the devil said, that's right, he doesn't like you. Is anybody catching my drift here? And so you're having this conversation, but the enemy now is, 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 is getting you cranky. Paul wasn't talking about that's taken money. If we walk according to the flesh, that's how we live. You can't do that. The devil can sow a seed of doubt in your mind, the flesh will take over. 2 Corinthians 11 says, this is what he said. And the whole reason that he was bringing this up, you've got to get the whole 
content. You've got to get the whole picture here. This is what was in his heart. He said in verse 2 Corinthians 11 verse 3, it says, But I fear lest somehow as the serp serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your mind may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. What he was saying here, look, all this that's going on over here has got a purpose. The enemy wants to take away the blessing. He wants to cause you to be deceived and, and, and become angry and upset and so forth. But if you can understand that that is not the heart of God, the heart of God is that He wants you to be blessed. Friend, don't, don't ever say that God has caused you pain. The enemy is the one that comes to deceive. And he's saying here, he said, I'm, I'm really concerned that the same devil that deceived Eve and took her that way is going to get into you and he's going to take you into destruction. Galatians 5.24 says, For those who are Christ." Or those who belong to Christ Jesus. I better read that to you. Galatians. Very quiet out there. But that's normal. It says here in verse 16, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusts after, sorry, for the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. Verse 19, it says, Now the works of the flesh are evident. He goes on to speak about things, all these horrible things. And verse 24, it says, And those, and those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. I want to say again, you cannot break a habit by part-time. You've got to crucify it. The things of the flesh have got to be crucified. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh. The flesh the godless human nature. Why did Jesus say these words? Jesus said these words, friends. In Luke 9, 23, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Not a nice thing, is it? I better read that to you as well. Luke you got Luke in your Bible? And he said to them, this is Jesus speaking, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. He who ever desires to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. What profits a man to gain the whole world and his, in himself is destroyed. What is it if a man should gain the whole world and lose his soul? When we read these scriptures, sometimes we can, we can make them so, so kind of religious. So with some or other, we, we've, we've got to, you know, live in denial or live in poverty or, or live in some state of, you know, where, where we can't have, a, have the pleasures. Though we're in this world, we're, we're not in it. We're not, we're, the world hasn't got us. And so people read this scripture and they think, oh man, if anyone desires to come up and let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. I honestly believe Jesus has paid the price for us in full. Do you believe that? 
If you really want to serve Him, you're going to have to surrender your will to God. I believe that's what He's saying. Deny yourself. Yourself things. Learn to, to trust Him. Understand that this world is, is, a, is a place that we're passing through. There's an eternity, amen. There's a place called heaven. Let him deny himself. Not what I want. What do you want, Lord? I'd like to go over and smack that bloke in the head. <laughs> you want real victory in your life, there's going to have to come a surrender of your will to the will of God. How many people remember that song, I Surrender All? How does it go? I surrender all. All to thee I, I surrender all. You know what? I found out that words are cheap. And sometimes we, we can stand with hands raised and sing a song like that and be totally, 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 totally full of self. See, I believe that God reads our hearts. And if we're really going to, this year, impact people around our lives, I believe that there's a few things that we have to do. I believe we've got to completely surrender. Take up our cross. What does that mean? Does that mean that I've got to somehow or other go through hell, go through pain and suffering. No, he did it for me. He did it for me. It's, this is not bondage that we're talking about. I believe it's freedom. You can't, I, I can't, please, you can't live a victorious, successful Christian life allowing the world and its pull to dominate and control you. You can't be led by every whim. We've got to somehow or other surrender. I surrender all. All to thee I really surrender. It's not bondage, it's freedom. It's alarming, I believe, to realize that our biggest hindrance in our walk with Jesus Christ, is our own flesh. Let that settle in for a little second. It's alarming to realize our biggest hindrance in our walk with Jesus is our own flesh. We lived in America for three years, and there was a sports store called Cabela's, about four acres of store. They had rods by the thousands. I'm trying to catch up with them. <laughs> they had lures, lures that actually caught other lures. They had, it was so big that they had restaurants in there. They had everything possible. People, they built these capellas in the middle of nowhere, built airstrips and hotels around them, and people would fly their own planes in. People would drive in there and stay in the, in the hotels and that around there. You could spend days there, a week even. There was every animal you could think of. There was every fish live swimming around in tanks that you could see that great big bass and, and, and then you'd go over to the bass section and buy all the gear to catch one of them. <laughs> the lust, you could feel the spirit of lust get on you as soon as you walked in the door. Then they had a boating section. They had every boat imaginable. Big boats, little boats, no boats, all boats. You could spend another day just looking at boats. 
They had everything. Man, I took Nancy there. She stayed about 10 minutes. But where we lived, not far from where we lived, there was an outlet section. Store after store. Levi. Levi. <laughs> All of them. Every shoe shop you could ever think of. Every shoe you could ever imagine. They had jewelry shops. They had all these shops. Nancy would go out there often. <laughs> I would go out there and stay for 10 minutes and I was gone. Things out there, lures trying to drag us in. Understanding the biggest hindrance. The biggest hindrance in our walk with Jesus is our flesh. And that's why Jesus said, if you want to follow me, deny yourself and crucify your flesh or take up your cross. Crucify your flesh. Friend, your flesh has to be crucified daily. It has resurrection services. <laughs> I'm going on a diet, and all of a sudden you see that steak and you cannot help yourself. You walk past the gelati section, and you just got to have yourself one of them. And you walk up later on and you say, I don't know, this diet isn't working. <laughs> the biggest hindrance in our walk with Jesus is our flesh. The flesh doesn't want to serve God. Doesn't want to change. It has to be brought into subjection. It has to be crucified. The Bible says the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, you can get inside you, he'll quicken your mortal body. It's time there your flesh will talk with you. You have more conversations with your flesh, most surely, than you realize. I'm not going to church today. It's too hot and nobody loves me. Then your wife comes in and says, Neil, you've got to go. You're the pastor. <laughs> the flesh will tell you, I don't like that person. I don't like him when he stands on the chairs. <laughs> I don't like that person. They're bossy. Don't look at the outward. Look at the heart of the person. Look at the heart. That's the one that may hold the key to your freedom. Your time. Take time to get to know them. Your time to hear their story. You know what changes me a lot when I hear this story? Every one of us has got a story. When I hear this story and their journey they had to walk through, the strongholds they had to break. Some people think I'm a little bit of an extrovert, but in reality I'm not. My natural personality is not a shy. So I have to do certain things to keep that thing, that shyness from coming back into me because it will. And sometimes I, get, I find myself in a, in a particular environment and that thing grabs hold of me and you'll find me in the back corner as far away from people as possible. But I've got to do things sometimes to shake it and sometimes it gets me into trouble. I was walking down the... Kawana Shopping Centre the other day and, and there was a man that's, there's a hearing section there sells hearing aids and so forth 
And he stands out the front like this and he's looking for us oldies that's walking past. And he starts to talk to you about coming in. I said, sorry, I can't hear you. <laughs> You know that our bodies were designed by God to live forever? At the fall of man, our flesh man was judged and condemned to death. That's what brought about the aging process in humanity. We weren't meant to age like this. You get a shock sometimes when I look in the mirror. Little children come up and play with my turkey gobbler under my neck. I'd do anything to get rid of that. <laughs> Adam lived 930 years. As that death thing came on him. Seth lived for 807. Joseph Roman reckons we've got 120. But down to 120. Some would say three score and ten. Some of us are living on borrowed time then. <laughs> the flesh is judged and aging and death is the result. That's why Jesus said, you must be born again. See, when God speaks to us through his word, he knows our frailties and our weaknesses. I want to say it again. Your biggest problem is not the devil. Your biggest problem is yourself. Your biggest problem is the flesh. I'm just going to continue this in a few days and another week or so and just talk a little bit more about the world, the flesh and the devil. So we can break some strongholds around our lives. We have to crucify the flesh. We have to bring it into submission. We have to lord it over our flesh. Otherwise, your flesh will lord it over you. I see one of those programs there where both male and female, go to these plastic surgeons to get all this work done on them. I've never seen such ugly people. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> that was an accident, truly was. I'm trying to be good. I, I do believe if the house needs painting, paint it. But they, people become obsessed. The flesh. You think, why would anybody do that to themselves? 75 operations. And they look ugly. flesh. Anybody catch my drift this morning? Mm -hmm. We've just got to stand up. I believe if we can build our spirit man, sometimes I see the flesh as a fat thing and the spirit little skinny thing. Our flesh, we've got to build our spirit man up. Build your spirit man up with T -t this morning while we are singing that, that first song, there was so much anointing on that song. When we are singing that song, I'm forgiven. You are the king. I'm just standing there singing, you are the And I, could, I just sense the power of God and the presence of God coming in on those words because don't just sing words. 
I surrender all. That can just be words. Or they can touch your heart. Father, help us in this place to crucify our flesh. Jesus, you said it. If, we want, if you want to follow me, deny ourselves and carry our cross, Lord, that wasn't some religious thing that become, people become so bowed down and so pressured by trying to do that. Father, I pray that we would be, Lord, people of the Spirit that would be able to just draw and drink and feed and feast upon you, my God, that we build up that inner man, that inner man, my God, the man, that, that the real man, that inner man would be built up to such a place, Lord, that we would be able to stand in the presence of our enemies. And Lord, you said that you would give us power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all of his works. But my God, if we're living flesh life, we, can't, we don't have that power. We don't have that authority. Let's call a spade a spade. Lord, we, we have people that, that are angry and bitter and, and troubles and, and problems in, with one another. My God, we've got, I like this one, I don't like that one, I this, that, and that. The, but God, you said if we don't discern your body, this, for this reason many would be weak in our midst and many would sleep and slumber or else what you meant would be dead. And Lord, the church basically needs a revival, it's dead. I pray, Lord, that you would send the fire of God into our midst. I pray, my God, your anointing would come upon us in a way, Lord, that whatever we do, we're aware that you stand and you watch and you listen and you see what's coming out of our heart. You see how we live during the week. You see what's going on around our lives. And Lord, your word declares that you will not be mocked. You can't put on a show. It's reality. And so, Father, I pray today that you would take this word that I've shared this morning and, Lord, you'd break it open to us. You'd, you'd touch us and help us to rise above the enemy. And, Lord, we'll give you all the praise and we'll give you all the glory. And everybody said, Amen and Amen. Friend, Jesus said, You must be born again. He knew. He knows the answer. He knows everything we need. And friend, today if you can just call upon his name, I know he will help you. He'll touch you. He'll meet with you.